Good evening. Tonight I'd like to write a short text with you so that you can see the writing process in action. Now I'd like to ask you to think back to a few of the recommendations I've given you over the past few weeks and the first one is the list of five content points which are often very helpful in a technical text. Uh, so the first is function. What does the product do and how does it work? The second is form. So what shape is it? The third, materials. So what's it made from? The fourth, manufacturing. How is it made? What processes are involved? And lastly, failure. What could go wrong? And it's also important to pay attention to a logical structure in your text. So you group things in a sensible way and you have a progression of logic. And it's important to remember your traditional English word order, subject, verb, object, and to give special attention to the opening and closing sentences. What I'd like to um, describe in a text with you today is this. It's a portable solder bath. It's quite old. The idea is um, that what you can do is you can um, melt some solder here in this little cast iron bath at the front. So you take your solder roll and when it's hot, um, you melt some here into the little bath. And then you can take the end of a wire or a component leg and you can dip this into the solder and coat the end with the soft solder which is a process known as tinning because soft solder normally contains a lot of tin. Soft solder, by the way, is solder which is softer when you perform a hardness test on it, but also generally um, solder which melts at a lower temperature, something less than about 450 degrees centigrade. And the idea of tinning um, the ends of the wires is that um, it helps if you're going to later solder them to already have some solder on the wires. It also prevents corrosion, provides a nice soft surface for screws to bite into, that kind of thing. So a useful thing to do in electrical engineering. And this really is a modified um, electric soldering iron. It's based on the design of a simple electric soldering iron. What I'll do, I'll plug this in and see if it works um, because I haven't tested it yet myself. So, and while we're writing the text, we can see if it works and hopefully I won't burn the place down. Now, when we're writing the text, the first thing that we need to think about is the opening sentence or the topic sentence. So we need to think um, it needs to be a subject with your, your subject, verb, object, word order. It sounds quite strange in English if you begin with a preposition or a subordinate clause, and it needs to name um, the product that we're going to describe and say basically what it does. So here we have a portable solder bath. So I'm going to write the portable solder bath provides a ready means for tinning wires with soft solder. It's not too long and it explains what the product does. So, we have our opening sentence. The portable solder bath provides a ready means for tinning wires with soft solder. And now we want to say something about the form of the product. And what shape is it? 
Now here, I'd say you've got two options. Either you can say that it's based on the design of a simple electric soldering iron, or you can pick something else. And the thing that strikes me is it looks like a hammer. It's more or less the shape of a hammer. It has a shaft here, it has a wooden handle, it has something which resembles a hammer head. And this is the one I'm going to pick for today. So, now that we've named the subject to the text, we can begin the next um, sentence with the word it, which is then, it's obvious that um, it refers back to the portable solder bath because that's the only thing which is in plural in the first sentence and it's the subject to the text. So, we can say, it resembles a hammer with a cast iron bath instead of a head now we'll mention the other differences the electrical cord here An electrical cord emerging from the handle. And if you've noticed, it also has two thermally insulating legs here. So this red leg here at the back is made of plastic and it supports the, the portable solder bath so that the whole um, shaft here is horizontal. And the front leg here is made out of thick wire. Now, because it's wire and it's quite long compared to its thickness, um, it also has quite good thermally insulating properties. So next, we'll describe these legs. And we can say, and two thermally insulating legs Because this is quite long, and then these here are the ends, and these are the sides perpendicular to the ends. Now, we want to say something about the function. We've briefly mentioned it in the opening sentence, but we also want to say what happens when you switch the power on. So, we can say that um, the current flows up the cable here, and it flows through the heating element. What you've got here is a heating element made out of nickel chromium wire and that causes resistive heating which then heats up the solder bath. So this we can explain now with quite a simple sentence. When the current flows Now here it might be good to say something about um, the nature of the heating element. Things that you could mention are perhaps um, the material or the power. I think I'm going to mention the power here because it's quite a lot more than you have in a regular soldering iron. It's 130 watts. So I'm going to say when the current flows a 130 watt heating element inside the bath, which we've already mentioned, melts the solder. And you can see the shape of the bath is such um, that you can easily um, take the end of a wire and dip it in and maybe shake off a little bit of solder so that it, um, you've got a nice thin layer on the wire. 
This here is called a spout, as you'd have on a jug. So you can say, a spout on the bath. allows wires to be neatly dipped in the solder. Now, we can look at the materials, what's it made from. The first thing to begin with is perhaps um, the heating element, um, the key functional part. To say it's made of nickel chromium wire. And we can continue the sentence like a list. So the heating element is made from nickel chromium wire. We've already said earlier that the bath is made from cast iron. So we can look at the shaft here, this part in the middle. The shaft from steel tubing and the handle here, which needs to be insulating, it's made of wood, and the manufacturing process um, was turning. So it's been um, put into a lathe, it's been spun around, and a sharp point has been used, like a sharp chisel, um, to strip away the wood and create a nice, smooth, curved um, surface, but something with rotational symmetry. And when you're talking about a lathe, um, the verb is to turn something and not to lathe something. So we can say, and the handle from turned wood. You notice here that when you've got two words serving as an adjective, like nickel chromium and cast iron, where we refer to the cast iron bath, then when it's two words serving as an adjective and it's in front of the noun, then it gets a hyphen. When it occurs at the end of the sentence, it does not. So if he said, the bath is made from cast iron, that's left with a space and then without a hyphen. The exception is one of, when one of these words ends with an ly, like a highly regarded professor, that would then not be hyphenated. We can now have one more sentence perhaps describing what the legs are made from. And you can see here the front leg is made from thick spideal wire and the rear leg um, from red plastic rod. So we can also add an extra word here to emphasize the function. The front supporting leg is made from thick steel wire and the rear leg from red plastic rod. Rod and bar are more or less synonyms, but um, normally bar would be used with metals. Now, how could it fail? Two very likely things um, that could happen. The heating element could corrode, and um, the cord here at the back, where the, the current flows into the soldering iron, um, this could, um, it could um, fail through fatigue. So um, the small wires inside, when they get bent back and forth, um, they could crack, and in either case, you'd have an open circuit. So you could say failure is most likely to result from an open circuit, 
and then you could name um, the two things that could cause the open circuit. the two causes of the open circuit, we can use a comma um, to join um, the two phrases together because the second one is not a full sentence. If it was a full sentence with your subject, verb, object, then it would be wrong. It would be a common mistake known as a comma splice. So you can say caused either by Corrosion of the element or by fatigue of the flexible cord. Here you can see I've added an additional adjective here flexible to emphasize um, one of the important characteristics of um, the power cord and because this goes together well with fatigue because fatigue is caused by um, cyclic stresses and very often by bending. What I'll also mention here is um, for the electrical engineers and when it comes to electrical failures um, there are usually two things that happen either you end up with an open circuit or a short circuit. And basically this is about the path um, that the current takes through your device. If there's an open circuit, then the path gets broken, a bit like this stick of chalk, which I probably don't need anymore. So then the path is broken and the electricity um, can't flow um, through this gap that's been created by the corrosion or by the fatigue crack, or you end up with an extra path a short circuit, which means that it doesn't flow through the device um, and create the, the effect or release the power that you want. Rather, it takes a shorter path and it usually causes a fuse to blow. So, this last sentence here is a good way to close the text. Failure is most likely to result from an open circuit caused either by corrosion of the element or by fatigue of the flexible cord. So that's a good point to end here. And what I'd like to do at this stage is um, I'll give you your assignment. Maybe I'll check to start with if, um, if the bath has actually heated up. It looks like there's a bit of slag in there, like it's corroded, but I'll see if perhaps I can melt some solder into here. There is a little bit, it, it melts a little bit. Oh yeah. Oh, now it's melting well. Yeah, there's some slag on there, some oxidized solder and flux. And now, despite this being a good 40 or 50 years old, it's in good working order. I'm not sure this make Ersa. I think Ersa is a German make. Not sure if it's East German or West German. Perhaps someone could tell me. But um, it looks like it still works well. And here, maybe, if I'm careful, I could take the end of this wire and dip it into this um, piece of solder to tin it. Yes, it works. And here you can see I've tinned the end of the wire. What I'd like to give you for your assignment this week is I'm going to give you a text um, which has been written in the past um, by another student who shall remain anonymous. It was long ago and he gave me his permission to use it. and. I'd like you to take this text, which is understandable, but has quite a lot of mistakes in it, and correct it. I'll give you that as a Word document, but I'd like you to submit your final corrected version as a PDF document, and I'd like you to submit that by the 25th of May. So, thank you for your attention today. I hope you found this useful. If you've got any questions, just send me an email, let me know. Thank you. That's all for now.